I invite now the author himself, Professor Kwamena Ahoy, to give us a reading of selected excerpts from the book that he himself has written. Now let's do it for him. Thank you very much. Good evening, my brothers and sisters. And uh, welcome to the show. Now, because the book is going to be reviewed, I have selected only two excerpts you know, to read for you. The first is entitled Ghana versus the USA in International Espionage, the Susudis Affair. In 1985, Ronald Reagan was president of the USA, and Jerry John Rawlings was the chairman of the PNDC and head of state of the Republic of Ghana. It was under their watch that one of the most audacious and dramatic incidents of international espionage involving the exchange of USA Ghanaian assets, that is the US euphemism for their spies, for another Ghanaian citizen occurred. Michael Agbuti Susudis was a cousin of Jerry John Rawlings and a vital source of sensitive and delicate information for Ghana's national security apparatus. He entered into a romantic dalliance with a young lady operations support assistant, the Americans refer preferred to describe her as a clerk, of the US CIA station in Accra. Her name was Susan Skranich. Over time, Ms. Skranich made over to Mr. Susudis CIA classified information, including the identities of the CIA agents or assets or spies in Ghana and in other West African countries. That list, according to the Americans, was made over to Captain Kujo Chikata, then in charge of national security under the PNDC. The US allegation was that Captain Chikata shared this information with the intelligence agencies of Cuba, Libya, the former East Germany, and other pro-Soviet Union nations. Some of the assets in Ghana were arrested, investigated, and handed over to me as a coordinator of the public tribunals to process them for trial before the public tribunals. Three of them were convicted of spying and sentenced by the public tribunals. The CIA feared that this was the beginning of more to come, that the Aspire network in West Africa had not only been compromised, but was about to be dismantled, and that their assets in Ghana faced the risk of execution, since the offenses under which they were being tried carried the death penalty. They panicked. They investigated and zeroed in on Ms. Skrinich as a likely source of the leakage. She was recalled to Washington, D.C., for consultations, where she was handed over to the FBI for interrogation. She confessed her deeds, was tried, convicted, and sentenced to five years' imprisonment, later reduced to two years. The FBI then decided to use her to entrap Susudis. Ms. Scarnage was made to extend an innocent invitation to her lover, Michael Susudis to visit her in the USA for them to embark on an idyllic vacation. It is important to know that Michael Susidis had all along been a legal permanent resident of the USA. On his arrival in the USA, Susidis was arrested and put on trial for engaging in espionage activities against the USA. The Americans then sent a signal to Accra that they were prepared to negotiate an exchange between Michael Susudis and their Ghanaian assets. The government agreed in principle to the negotiated exchange in a return signal to them. The negotiations began in a very bizarre fashion. The CIA sent down to us, through the US Embassy in Accra, a list of almost 100 Ghanaians, including the names of some very prominent citizens, all of whom they claimed were their assets. They wanted to take out all these persons, as well as their spouses, their children, and their parents. 
The Americans provided their full details, including their addresses, their schools, in the case of the children, their workplaces, and various other particulars. They wanted to take these assets and their relations away to the USA by landing a C-130 military transport plane at the Tamale airport to evacuate all of them in one flight. In all, about 400 Ghanaians were to be evacuated in the exercise. Ghana's counterintelligence unit went to work. They advised us to reject the proposal on three main grounds. One, the list clearly contained names of persons who could not possibly be CIA assets and was intended to destabilize Ghana's intelligence architecture. Two, the so-called assets acted as individuals. Their sins could not therefore be extended to their spouses, their children, and their parents. Three, the use of a C-130 military transport plane posed a grave security risk to Ghana. What if 500 US Marines popped out of the plane and launched an attack on the country? We went back to the drawing board. The Americans took back the list and reduced the number of the so-called assets to about 50. They also dropped the demand for their spouses, their children, and parents to be evacuated alongside them. It was then decided that I should interview each of the persons on the new list and make a determination as to whether, in my view, the person was a CIA asset or not. The persons were also to indicate their willingness to be voluntarily repatriated to the USA in exchange for Michael Susudis. At the end of my interviews with the persons on the list, only eight of them accepted to leave for the USA under the arrangement, implicitly admitting that they were indeed CIA assets or spies. So it came to pass that on the appointed day, the eight self-confessed US CIA assets were driven in a convoy of about 20 vehicles led by the IGP and police dispatch riders from the police CID headquarters to the Lumi International Airport in Togo, where the rest of the heads of agreement were implemented to the letter. I was at the CID headquarters to make sure that everything went according to plan, but did not travel with them to Togo. I have left out a lot of the details because I want you to buy the book and read it for yourself. The second excerpt is titled Officer of the Volta, Ovi. By the end of President Rawlings' first term of office on 6th January 1997, I had decided to leave frontline politics and not to continue in office as minister in his second term as president. I had communicated my decision to both President Rollins and Captain Kojo Chikata, and neither of them had objected to my decision. Not too long after Rollins' inauguration as the president of the second government of the Fourth Republic on 7th January 1997, but before he began the nomination of his ministers, I received a telephone call from Captain Chikata. He asked me to submit my curriculum, my CV, to the State Protocol Division because President Rollins had decided to bestow a state honor on me. I was ecstatic and extremely appreciative because I believed this was Jerry's way of bidding farewell to me as I exited his government. I duly complied and submitted my CV. On the appointed day, bedecked in my colorful kente cloth, in which I must admit I felt very uncomfortable as I was not used to wearing cloth. And accompanied by my wife, Comfort, and my siblings, I reported at the venue for the event at the frontage of Parliament House. When it got to my turn to be presented with a medal of the officer of the Volta and the scroll of honor, President Rollins held on to me for an unusually long time. What people did not realize was that he was talking to me. I still remember his words as if it were yesterday. Munia, he said, we started this journey together. Don't abandon me in the middle of the journey. Let us finish the journey together. In the euphoria of the moment, and given, that, and given the solemnity of the occasion, what else could I say but mumble, yes, sir? <laughs> With that, I was locked into Rollins' second government of the Fourth Republic, and I had become the proud recipient of the state honor 
of the officer of the Volta. Thank you very much.